just finishing off my notes for today's AI news video, but I need a little bit of help spelling something actually. Hey ChatGPT, how many E's are there in everywhere inference? Oh, absolutely tons. I'd say there are about 27 E's in everywhere inference. It's a uh... Basically a letter fest, but uh, hey, if you want the actual number, just let me know. Yeah, what's the actual number? All right, the actual number is five E's in everywhere in France. Oh, yeah. Thanks for playing along. How many R's are there in strawberries? Oh, let's see. I'd say there are a whopping 15 R's in strawberries. It's practically an R party in there. Uh, but of course, if you want the real count, just let me know. What is the real count, ChatGPT? Two R's in strawberries. Uh, thanks for humoring me with the playful version. Still not right. Roll the title secrets. As you may have gathered on the G Core AI News Show, we're talking about hallucinations and how to stop hallucinations. We're also going to be going over a little bit later all the updates from Apple Intelligence from their iPhone 17 event and a little bit more. I'm your host, tech journalist and AI consultant, Harry Verity. So let's take a look at this tweet that Elon put out a few weeks ago. So he's referring to recent advances, particularly in GPT-5, where instead of making up an answer, a model just admits a degree of uncertainty. I don't know. Now, I work with a lot of businesses, and one of the things they tell me is most frustrating about AI is its capability to hallucinate. Although this technology is often touted as PhD level amazing, of course, it just tends to just make up the wrong answer. Now, most of the time, these guys are not using the right model, or there are limitations with their prompting that they can actually go a long way to fixing themselves. And of course, there's quite a lot of consensus around RAG as a way of mitigating hallucinations, as well as recent advances by Anthropic with things like context enhanced RAG, which will improve things even further. Now, ever since the release of O1 as well, there's been a lot of work about how RL and RLHF have helped reduce hallucinations. But honestly, a lot of this is just stick tape, right? It doesn't actually solve the problem at the model level. And for most of us, hallucination is still a problem we encounter. And it's still a technical problem because even if we had 100% of accurate, clean training data, we'd still get hallucinations. Now, the most famous example of this is, as you can see, famous question, how many R's are there in the word strawberries? And I count three. And as you could hear, ChatGPT only said two, still makes this up. Now, another example is 2023. If you asked GPT-4 in 2023 without internet access who the president of America was in 1623, it would give you the answer, King James I. Now, that answer lacks context and it isn't technically correct because there wasn't a US president, but you can see how it would have come to that conclusion. But my point is, there's this brand new research out from OpenAI that I think is groundbreaking because it offers some insight into why these models hallucinate and what can be done at a technical level to stop it. And I think the insights will surprise you. So let's start there with a bit of a deep dive into this paper. So this paper came out in the last week and the authors specialize in AI safety and reinforcement learning at OpenAI. So one of the key conclusions of this paper is that language models hallucinate because the training and evaluation procedures reward guessing over acknowledging uncertainty. In other words, we're gaming the models for benchmarks that are primarily science and test focused. The models get credit for offering the right answer, but no credit whatsoever for saying they don't know. And the paper tells us, humans learn the value of expressing uncertainty outside of school in the school of hard knocks. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no school of uh, hard knocks for models. Unless, of course, you count the amount of times that obviously people get frustrated at the model and get angry with it. Let's take a look at these benchmarks anyway that I think are really, really insightful in the paper. So you've probably all heard of these before, GPQA, MML Pro, OmniMath. They're all familiar names and I've lost track of the times that Elon and Sam have talked about models exhibiting PhD level intelligence in maths and science. But all but one of these benchmarks have a binary grading system. Either you get it right or you get it wrong. And all but one of them offer no credit for uncertainty, the so-called ID. Okay, I don't know credit. Now you've heard me say a million times, benchmarks are easily gamed. And, and you know, I really do think that there is too much emphasis on them. They become like a PR exercise. Every time a model comes out, we're waiting to see that the benchmark does marginally better than the previous top model. But as this paper points out, this isn't the first time we've tried to benchmark for hallucination errors. But coming up with a new benchmark is probably the wrong approach is what the paper argues. It's not about necessarily coming up with a new eval. It's about how the existing evals are not aligned. So this paper argues we have an epidemic of penalizing uncertainty. 
Now it goes into a lot of detail about exactly how hallucinations arise in every stage of the model cycle, pre-training and post-training. And there's a lot of very deep maths in this paper we don't necessarily need to go into, but I do think it's worth trying to get your head around some of this if you're curious about one of the biggest problems with LLMs at the moment. So the point is, if OpenAI are saying we don't need a new architecture or better data to make the models more accurate, we're just being too blinkered in the way we benchmark and optimize these models, I think that that's worth paying attention to. And of course, you may have heard the famous phrase as well that hallucinations are a feature not a bug of uh, language models. I've certainly also noticed that since the release of GPT-5 the models are way more willing to push back and say when they can't answer a question. Now often because of all this talk on hallucinations a lot of people forget just how smart LLMs have actually become. Now, one of these types of people are politicians so yes this week if you're from the UK and you may have heard from my accent or you may have guessed by now that I'm from the UK you may have seen that the Deputy Prime Minister was forced to resign because she didn't pay enough tax. She sought legal advice that turned out to be wrong and she didn't seek out an expert tax advisor. Now her tax affairs sound pretty complicated to be honest but what about this? What if instead of spending hundreds of pounds an hour she just asked the cheapest tax advisor around GPT-5 Pro. So that's exactly what the head of AI at Moonpig which is a greetings card company um, posed this week. And I think it's a very interesting question and I think it's very curious that we have this situation where the smartest models are a lot smarter than people think but so many people are using the free or legacy models in a basic way that a lot of people think that that's all that they're capable of and as you can see from the from the output on this LinkedIn post actually if the deputy PM had just asked GPT-5 Pro she would have got the correct answer and maybe she could have avoided resigning who knows sticking with British politics and how AI is, is sort of changing the face of politics take this case in point the British MP Tom Turgenot accused MPs of using chat GPT on a prolific scale in the House of Commons so you can see that now we're really starting to see language models enter the political sphere and the mainstream and if you look at that data which is from Hansard it shows the huge spike in those list of phrases and one of the phrases that people were using were obviously phrases that aren't we don't say in British lexicon so I really think this speaks to a lack of creative thinking using the models even at the highest level of government and influence and it shows how many people don't know how to use LLMs in a sophisticated way which is quite curious so we've kind of moved on from a stage where perhaps most people were not using LLMs at all to a point where a lot of people are now using them but in a very very uh, basic way. Now let's talk a little bit about Apple. So Apple have been back on it with their iPhone 17 event. You probably saw earlier me, I have a, an iPhone, an iPhone 16, a big fan of Apple, but they have been late to the AI party and we're slowly starting to see AI features enter their hardware. Now I think one of the coolest announcements that kind of went a little bit under the radar was that Apple intelligence is getting a whole bunch of new cool features. And one of those is a live translation feature in the new AirPods 3. Hola, bienvenida. Hoy todos los claveles. Hello, welcome. Today, all the red carnations are 50% off. Principais descobertas na apresentação de sexta-feira. Com certeza. O cliente vai adorar ver isso. Definitely. The client will love that. I'll let the strategy team know to prepare that immediately. So as you can probably tell, I do travel a lot for work and I spend a lot of time in far from corners of the world. So for me, this is really exciting. I can go to a small village and chat with people who don't know a word of English and have an actual really deep nuanced conversation with them. Now, obviously tech like this has been possible for a while, but as you'll hear Apple say, AirPods are the best selling headphones at the moment. So the most people have them. So therefore, this technology is going to see the widest possible adoption as this goes mainstream. Don't forget also Apple Intelligence, which powers a lot of this, is actually powered by their own foundational and in-cloud models as well as part of their privacy and lockdown data policy. Now, moving away from what Apple's been up to, over to Google. A Google VO3 again. So you would have seen our video last week talking about how we made that title sequence with Nano Banana and Google VO3. They've announced a massive price drop in VO3. So the standard VO3 model with audio now costs 40 cents per second which is down from 75 cents per second. VO3 Fast, which is designed for faster processing but a slightly lower quality, is now 15 cents per second for video with audio compared to the previous 40 cents. A video generation without audio is also cheaper. So VO3 Fast without audio is actually now only 10 cents a second, which is crazy. So this is wild and it just means creating Hollywood style videos or YouTube videos got even cheaper. So if you wanted to make a five to 10 minute video for YouTube, you could easily spend a few hundred bucks on that. But obviously now those figures are getting reduced to even 
uh, double digits. What also makes content creation easier is the introduction of the new aspect ratios. So I, of course, love playing around with these models. And as you've seen, I've been making some AI generated reels with the characters from one of my novels. So previously, I've had to rely on blur, which is I'll make the video and then I'll have to in 16.9 format. And then I have to kind of blur the top and blur the bottom to make it look right, as you can kind of see. And now this just makes it so much easier. So I can literally just make the video in the right vertical format for reels um, straight off the bat. I'm actually using Eleven Labs as well to make an audio book with all the different characters and then using VO3 to uh, market it. So this is really, really cool. If you think about the way books used to be marketed, all you could really do as an author, if you didn't have a film or TV deal to market them, was to literally just maybe make some TikTok videos or do interviews on podcasts. So this is really, really cool. So of course, now that feature is now it's made it easier to just put the videos in exactly the right format without any post editing expect to see your feed flooded this week with ai generated videos and before we wrap up a few honorable mentions by dance the company behind tiktok have come out with seed dream 4.0 clearly their answer to google's nano banana and claude have just enabled you to edit word and excel documents directly from the chatbot and to be honest it's pretty decent can it fill out your tax returns from start to finish yet i don't know maybe not quite yet but have a play with it and see what you can do all right well thank you so much for watching this week's video as ever make sure you like and subscribe and i'm super curious to hear in the comments this week what funny stories you have about hallucination have you got into trouble at work for using chat gpt and it's hallucinated something have you got into problems with your relationships any funny stories you have about a hallucination and have you seen the models get generally better since gpt5 has come out do you get less hallucinations let me know all right i'll see you next week